All right, and sitting down with us today, we have real estate developer, business coach, and founder of the original Ottawa Senators, we have Bruce Firestone. Bruce, how are you doing today, sir? I'm good, Kyle, except it wasn't the original Ottawa Senators. You should know that. They played in the <laughs> NHL uh, back in the day. They were an original member of the, uh, of the team. Uh, of the, the, NHL, era, the National right? League, wait, and they won how many Stanley Cups? Was it 11? There you go. I always used to think it was nine Stanley Cups, but Cyril Leader, the former president of the Senators, uh, he reminded me there were two, two extra challenges. So we actually won 11 Stanley Cups, played in the National League until 1933. There was a Great Depression in the 1930s, kind of reminiscent of what we're going through right now in many ways. And uh, the team folded, moved to St. Louis, played there for one year. And then, you know, that was it. And every time I hear about the original six, I want to puke. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, because the original six is not the original six. The, it was the original 10 or 11 in National League teams when the National Hockey League was formed. And Ottawa Senators were one of them. So can you please tell all those talking heads on TV to correct themselves? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely send some uh, notes to our friends over at TSN there and they'll... Uh, yeah, they'll, yeah, they're going to listen to you and me, brother. It, it, exactly, yeah, yeah. You, you and me, we'll, we'll give them some talking points there for sure. We'll, 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 we'll correct them a few times. So, I, I mean, December 6th just happened and that actually marked, yeah. you know, 30 year anniversary of when yeah. you guys got awarded the franchise, right? Yep. Does it seem like it, it was just yesterday that, that you guys got the news that you were getting the team? Like, has time just flown by? Uh, actually not. Um, uh, you know, when, when I turned 49, my mom called me and said, you know, Bruce, uh, hockey years, I'm 69 now, but when I turned 49, she said, hockey years are two for one. She said, you're older than me now. <laughs> and, um, it, and so the amount of work, Kyle, that we had to do to put that team together, put the bid together, put the team together, you know, do all the financing, get our building, our new arena built uh, back in the day. It was so arduous. There isn't one day of it that I want to relive. Yeah. And uh, it, it, it 30 years does seem like 60 to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, aging and dog years there almost. For, I, I, uh, well, not quite, years. but it for sure as hell feels like. And I'll tell you, you know, I do a little bit of keynote speaking now. I did one yesterday and the first one I did this year because of the pandemic. But, uh, you know, when people see me, they remember me as a 39 year old getting the team. You know, I'm 69 now, 30 years ago, I was 39. And, you know, young, handsome, uh, a guy or relatively speaking not necessarily brad pitt but better than at 69 <laughs> and then they see me i walk on the stage what the hell happened and i go well wait a second when you're 39 and you're 69 I take pictures yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> so I, I mean you know just even from the, the get-go you guys had sort of a, an interesting start to even the idea of it right like in, in my experience some of the worst ideas that my friends come up with are sometimes after a game of pickup hockey or in a locker room Oops. or whatever but i mean you guys the original idea for actually putting the bit together came to place yeah. after a game of you know shinny hockey what, what, it, it, what was the did. reaction like there it did well uh, um, the, the reaction was disbelief. And I, for a lot of reasons, I think that, that at that time, uh, there was a, uh, uh, you know, we, Canada was entering, uh, this is the 90s, and you probably weren't even born then, but back in the, uh, you know, early 90s, Canada was facing a very tough recession. Uh, you know, the government of Canada was running at that time an unprecedented deficit. We were about 18 months away, I think, from being uh, bankrupt as a nation and being under IMF supervision. And, uh, you know, and we were about to lose two teams in Canada, the Nordiques and uh, the Jets. And we got the Jets back, but not yet the Nordiques. I'm hoping one day we will see the, the Quebec Nordiques again. But so there was a lot of skepticism for a lot of reasons. One, Ottawa is, is considered a, a very boring town. I, I don't agree with that assessment, but you know, this is where people, Canadians pay their income taxes to. So everybody hates Ottawa <laughs> automatically. Uh, so number one, we're a boring town, we're a small town, you know, nothing ever happens in Ottawa. We're, we're in a recession. Who are these guys? They're young guys. I was 38 or 37 when we announced, 39 when we got the team. Cyril must have been, Cyril Leader became the president of the team and Randy Sexton, who was a, a co-founder as well, they must have been in their late 20s. And so, you know, we were young. And, and I, I don't agree with that assessment, Kyle. I mean, you're a young person, but I, I don't, uh, ageism, I think is wrong, whether it's older people, you know, uh, saying young people don't know anything, can't do anything, or, or young people thinking the same thing about older people. I, I, I think that is misplaced. You know, the difference between an old person and a young person isn't the number of years you've gone around the, uh, the sun. It's whether you're open to learning new things. Mm -hmm. 
I know old 30 year olds and I know young 80 year olds. Yeah. And that's the difference. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, like you just said, there was obviously so many moving parts to it, too. And yeah. even before you present to the NHL to actually yeah. say, hey, here's our vision, you know, what were some of the biggest hurdles to actually get it from idea after a game of shinny to, yeah. you know, here, here's our sort of pitch to you guys? Was it working with the city? Was it the land? Was it the arena? Like, what were the biggest I, things? Can I share my screen with you? Because I do have a few slides I'd like to show you and your viewers and your listeners. Obviously, your listeners can't see it, but your viewers can. Um, and uh, can you see the slides okay? Yeah. All right. So people always ask me, you know, how the heck did you ever come up with this cockamamie idea to bring an NHL team to Ottawa? And really what was happening was this was back in the late 80s, so quite a while ago now. And uh, I was driving in my old Saab up and down the Queensway, which is Highway 417 in Ottawa. And uh, I was sort of trying to map out a new path for the company, the first parent company of the Ottawa Center. It's Terrace Investments Limited, which I own. And, um, you know, we were building office buildings and shopping plazas and doing subdivisions, you know, which was great. But I was a young man. I was surrounded by a very talented group of uh, mostly young people. And, and I thought we could do something exciting. What was it? And so I asked myself, what does Toronto have that Ottawa doesn't? And uh, see if I can change the slide here. And um, I said, oh, they've got a zoo. I don't, don't know much about animals. And they have the Princess of Wales Theater. I don't think that makes much money. Uh, and then I said, oh my gosh, they got the Toronto Maple Leafs. <laughs> and, and I thought, you know, I wonder if the NHL is getting ready to expand again. I think there were 21 teams back then. Mm -hmm. There's gonna be 32, I think next year. And, and so, uh, you know, I thought maybe they'll expand again. Hmm, that's interesting. And I wonder if, um, you know, if Otto is big enough to sustain a team and could we be the bidder? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, exactly as you described, uh, Kyle, I asked Randy Sexton and Cyril Leader if they'd hang back after a game of shitty. They were much better players than me. <laughs> and I said, you know, hey, guys, I think the NHL is going to expand again. And uh, Randy said, oh, that's interesting, Cyril. Yeah, that's interesting. And I said, you know, I think Ottawa was big enough to sustain a team. Huh. And then I said, I think maybe we could be the bidders. Randy's a, a MBA from Clarkson in the States and, and a good hockey guy. And immediately he gets, oh, yeah, let's do it, man. This is awesome. Cyril was much more cautious. He's a chartered accountant. And, you know, accountants always ask the question, how much is it going to cost? And that's yeah. what Cyril said. And there's a picture of the old uh, Lions Arena where we were. It's no longer in existence, but that's where we were. So uh, I didn't know how much it was going to be to buy uh, an expansion team. And I guessed $35 million, which is what uh, NBA franchises were going for then. Much more today, obviously. But the franchise fee turned out to be $50 million. Yeah. And uh, so to answer Cyril's question, uh, I had a plan, a, a simple plan to bring back the centers. And as we said, uh, it was one of the original members of the uh, original founding of the National Hockey League. Mm -hmm. So the idea was really simple. And the idea was to buy 600 acres. You can see it on the screen here. Put a, an NHL expansion franchise and an NHL arena into the middle of it or somewhere in the uh, uh, franchise. If you can see my cursor moving around here, this was the original location, which is where the Canadian Tire Center is. Mm -hmm. And so the idea was to buy 600 acres. We only really needed 100. Yeah. So the idea was to, again, create a, a, a really outstanding building, uh, a National Hockey League franchise, and then hopefully the value of the land that we bought around it would go up. We would sell that. We'd put the money into, uh, you know, an armored truck, take it down to New York and give it to the NHL. That was the plan. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to show you this picture. No comments about how <laughs> long, young I look there and how old I look now. I'm in the middle there with the yellow tie. On yeah. my right is a serial leader. You can see how young the team was. On yeah. my left is Randy Sexton. And this is the group that, that really put this whole deal together. It wasn't a big group. And you don't really need a lot of people, Kyle to change the world. If you have the right people, you know, I think the prophet Muhammad came out of the Saudi deserts with like five or six followers and obviously he changed the world. I think Jesus had 12 disciples, right? So you don't really need that many followers. And we had this wonderful talented group of young men and, and young women, mostly young men and mostly young women uh, who, who were so committed to making this happen, they would have walked through a wall and they did walk through a wall. And I always tell this story, and I, I'll let you ask me some more questions in a minute. I won't hog the, the limelight forever. But I have to tell this story to your listeners and also to your viewers. And that is, 
the night before we actually got the team, you got to remember, we had bought 600 acres. We'd spent seven, over $7 million buying this land. We spent about two and a half million dollars just on the bid itself. So we were in for about nine or 10 million bucks, which is quite a lot. We had sold 15,000 uh, PRNs, priority registration numbers, and taken folks, you know, their money for season tickets for a team that didn't yet exist. Mm-hmm. And we had over 500 corporate sponsors. So there was a lot of pressure on us to bring home the bacon, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, so the night before, there's like this 700 person uh, dinner going on. And, um, and, and uh, I'm there, there were 120 fans from Ottawa who came down with us, like just crazy fans who love hockey and love NHL hockey. And we had the Ottawa Fire Department marching band. Somehow they were playing music when the other bidders were, were presenting and they were quiet when we were. I don't know how that happened. It was just magic, <laughs> I suppose. So we had these crazy people down there in, in Palm Beach where the winter meetings were uh, for the National Hockey League. This is 1990, December of 1990. And uh, it was really exciting. And I, I thought we had a, a good shot at getting this team. Randy and I had spent two and a half years on a plane. We had met every single owner except one, uh, not once, not twice, sometimes three or four times, you know, go and have dinner with the owners, uh, learn more about them, go see a game with them. Always you cheer on the home side, right? Mm-hmm. And, and so, and, and, you know, tell them all kinds of nice things about Ottawa and about ourselves. But one of the members of the Board of Governors came up to me at this 700 person uh, NHL family dinner that we were having in the in, in Palm Beach and he, he put his face really close to mine about eight inches away and said I want to tell you one thing Mr. Firestone I said yes sir you will never ever ever get a franchise in Ottawa I went whoa uh that that's not good you know all of the stress and the pressure is building on 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 yours truly Mm -hmm. and uh, i said to him look i i I think that's a mistake i think you should give a franchise to cities that love nhl hockey to people who will treasure it and protect it and nurture uh, the franchise and that would be ottawa and that would be us Mm -hmm. and he said well you heard what i said and he walked away i went whoa so i went back to our our table and this is a picture of me right after getting that word from uh uh, yeah, I was, you know, I wasn't actually crying, but I was pretty upset. And uh, I don't know if it's ever happened to you, Kyle, but when men get upset, their voices tend to go up a little bit in pitch. Yeah. And so Cyril comes over and he just, yeah, I'm, I'm just sitting there white faced and really stressed out. And he says, Bruce, it, what's happening? Oh, well, everything's fine. You know, everything's good. <laughs> and then Randy comes up and the same squeaky voice comes out of my mouth. I couldn't believe it. What the hell? And uh, finally, Norm Green, who was the owner of the Minnesota North Stars, which became the Dallas Stars, as you know, uh, came over to me and uh, he was good friends w- with me. And he said, Bruce, w- what's the matter? And I, I, I told him and, um, and he said, well, that, look, maybe that's one vote you're not going to get. Uh, but he, I re- remember this line, get that schmucky look off your face, kid, and get out there and hustle. I said, gosh, you know, he's right. And so I kind of pulled myself together and I said, okay, maybe that is a vote I won't get. I'm going to go and, and nail down the other 20 votes. Yeah. Um, so the next day, the NHL Board of Governors, they meet and they, there's hours and hours of meetings. And finally at one o'clock, just a little after one on December, I think, 6, 1990, uh, they announce, uh, uh, you know, I'm there. Uh, Phil Esposito, you can see Phil Esposito if you know who he yeah. is, obviously a very famous uh, player, and uh, uh, he was representing Tampa Bay, I was representing Ottawa, and there's the president in the middle of this photograph, John Ziegler, soon to be replaced by Gary Bettman as commissioner. Yeah. But the next day, uh, the NHL, just after 1 p.m., announces the NHL is pleased and proud to announce today conditional memberships have been granted to the cities of Ottawa and Tampa. So we're sister uh, uh, franchises, brother franchises, Tampa and Ottawa, joined at the hip. So uh, when when that happened, I turned to John. I mean, Randy Sexton was super pumped. He had a 30-inch vertical, I think, that day. (laughs) Even Cyril was uh, emotional, which is very unusual for him. And uh, the other members of our team were were really happy. And, and of course, I was, too, uh, really, frankly, moved to tears. But I turned to John, Mr. Ziegler, and I said, John, what was the vote for Ottawa? I said, what do you mean? I said, well, how many people voted for Ottawa? He said, it was unanimous. I said, oh, really? That's great. I didn't know that. <laughs> and uh, I said, oh, my gosh, we got them all, all the votes. About three weeks later, you know, came back to Ottawa. We did a season ticket drive. And we, we, we it was a lot of work. And we had about a year and a half or two years to get ready to put a team on the ice. And we needed every day of that. Yeah. But I got a call. And this is one of the story I wanted to tell. I got a call from that member of the board. 
of governors. And he said, do you remember that comment I made uh, the night before you bought the franchise? I said, yeah. I certainly do. I'll remember that till the, the day I die. Um, he said, I want to tell you what we did. And me and three other members of the board got together and we decided to go up to every single bidder, Hamilton, Seattle, Milwaukee, Houston, St. Petersburg, Tampa, Ottawa, and there were a few others, uh, and say the same thing. You will never, ever, ever get a franchise in city, whatever city it was. We wanted to see who would quit and who wouldn't. And the only two who continued to lobby and press for franchises were you and Phil Esposito. And those are the people we gave the franchise to. Wow. And the others, some of them got mad, some of them left, um, uh, you know, and, uh, but the you two guys, we, we couldn't discourage you. So we said, and so really at the end of the day, Kyle, it does sort of bring home a lesson that I think we all need to learn. And I have learned uh, many times over that um, uh, the most important thing in, in life is, is probably trust. And they trusted Phil and they trusted me to, to do our very best to, you know, to to put a, a decent uh, squad on the ice and to nurture and and, uh, and bring these franchises to life and and that's who they gave the franchise to um and 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 then just as a footnote to this when i came back to to ottawa uh you know uh, we had some issues with our building i don't know if you know that story but but uh, mr ray was premier of the province of ontario bob ray you can see him here on the screen and um he represented the NDP and the NDP government of Ontario, and they were very strong in Hamilton. They had lots of representation in Hamilton, not so much in Ottawa. And they wanted the franchise to go to Hamilton, not Ottawa. So they opposed the construction of what we called at that time the Palladium, now Canadian Tire Centre. And I remember getting a call from Phil, Mr. Esposito there, and he calls me up and he's super excited three or four weeks after he... Um, he uh, got the franchise for Tampa and he said, uh, hey, Bruce, I'm really uh, excited. I got a call from the governor of the state of Florida congratulating me, laying out the red carpet. What can we do for you? Let me know my office is here to help. How was your reaction when you go back to Ontario? And I said, Phil, a little different. We got a lawsuit. <laughs> yeah. So I was on the stand for three and a half days defending our project, uh, cross-examined by you know, the Perry Mason of OMB lawyers. Um, and uh, the whole hearing took about 13 and a half weeks, but thank goodness we were able to, uh, uh, you know, to get the franchise and to get the building. Uh, this is our first year team. I'm in the middle there surrounded by a team. Uh, mm -hmm. it, you know, we didn't get many points that first year. Uh, I think we had 24 points and I had set a goal for the team of 22 or more. And people asked me, uh, players on the team, why, why 22 or more? And I said, well, the worst ever team was uh, the Washington Capitals in the early 70s when they got 21 points. Let's not go there. And they all said, absolutely not. We got 24, including one road win. And Brad Marsh in the middle of the year, because we had so many losses, stood up at the dressing room, I'll never forget this. And he said, it's not that we're a bad team. It's just that we play in a very, very good league. Yeah. And uh, so everybody laughed and it kind of took a little bit of the pressure off him. And, and we actually played better after, after that. So there's the team. Uh, we are very proud of this building that we built. We did get it built. And one of the things I said just before, and this is the last slide I'm going to show, just before we, uh, uh, I turn it back to you as the host, and sorry for stealing so much of your time, um, is that I did write for the 25th anniversary of the founding of the team, Don't Back Down, the real story of the founding of the NHL's Ottawa Senators and why big leagues matter. And uh, I'm going to provide you a link afterwards that, you, you know, it's good until January 4th, 2021. And if anybody's interested in that story, see, people seem to like it. There are four themes in it, obviously, about the Sens. Lots of stuff, lots of background stuff about the National League that uh, people maybe know and but maybe they don't. And there's quite a bit of real estate because I'm a real estate guy. And the fourth thing, as I said, before we started recording is uh, the, uh, the fourth theme is my personal story, which my wife, as I said to you, didn't want me to put in, nobody be interested in it, but <laughs> apparently tens of thousands of people were. So yeah. I'll provide that to you afterwards. Yeah, yeah. And we'll, we'll make sure we throw it up there for uh, all the listeners as well too, and they can head on over Absolutely. There. Listeners and viewers, I, I sure hope. I, 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 I'd like to share the story. Uh, it is a good story. I think it has been optioned now for a film. Out of the same guys who make Letter Kenny, mm -hmm. <laughs> they want to make a film out of it. And I'm not sure who should play me, that's for sure. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, I, yeah, you know, like you said before, we'll see what Brad Pitt's doing there. Maybe he's got a uh, no, he's, he's, or something there. He's doing a lot of my league. <laughs> so, I, I mean, for those that are, are watching the visual portion of this here, you know, we, we just saw quite a few of the jerseys that might not be recognizable to some of the millennials yeah. there. You know, you had the big Peace Tower logo and all of that. You know, how, how did you guys sort of morph from that iteration to the actual 2D logo that ended up going on your jerseys for the inaugural season? That's a neat question. So Dave O'Malley, who's a wonderful graphic artist, still active in Ottawa, I think, uh, uh, he designed the Peace Tower logo. And that was the logo that we wanted to use for the Bring Back the Senators campaign. You know, we wanted something, you know, uh, like if you think of Seattle, you know, you think of that needle. And if you think of Toronto, you think of what is it that uh, the CN Tower, whatever yeah. they call it. Oh, or maybe the Sky Dome. Uh, but for, for Ottawa, I think most people think of the Peace Tower, right? Mm -hmm. So that was the logo that was the Bring Back the Senators campaign logo, which is still a great logo in my opinion. But the actual uh, logo to play, you can see it on my Ascends hat here, it's brand new by the way. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it is, uh, you know, it goes, the Senators, we didn't want to talk about the Canadian Senate or the American Senate. We wanted to talk about the Roman Senate. Mm -hmm. And the reason we wanted to, you know, the, this is a Roman general, we wanted a, you know, a theme, you know, hockey players are, are fairly macho, you know, may not be politically correct, but most of them are pretty macho guys, or at least they were back then. And, uh, and so we wanted something that was more of a warrior symbol, because it's a battle. I mean, I don't have to tell you, you know, NFL football and NHL hockey are collision sports, and it's a battle. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, and, you know, not, not only did you guys sort of go to that 2D logo there, but obviously there had to be some thought as well to, you know, what are we even going to call the team? Are we going to go back to the, you know, the Silver Sen 7 era? No, 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 no. There, there, was was never dis no. there was never a discussion of that. Uh, I saw to that. I mean, look, one of the things I wanted to do was I wanted to build on, on history. And I'm a history buff. Mm -hmm. And um, the fact that the Sens won 11 Stanley Cups, which is still, I think, third most. I think Montreal has more Stanley Cups than any other team. It's in the 20s. Mm -hmm. And I think Toronto's number two, but most people don't know this. Ottawa is number three. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if we had called ourselves the Silver Seven or we'd called ourselves the Ottawa whatevers, uh, you know, the Ottawa Peace Towers, yeah. um, you know, you can't claim to have won 11 Stanley Cups. So uh, this is a kind of a cool story. We, um, uh, we wanted to call the team the Ottawa Senators. So I had our law firm, back then it was Pearly's, I had our law firm uh, look at the copyright right back to the 1890s because the, the team actually started in the 1890s. And most people don't know that there was a football team called the Ottawa Senators too. And I think they actually won a great cup sometime in the line. So I think they actually won one or two great cups under the name. So <laughs> popular name most people don't know that. And I didn't know that, but nobody had registered the name, uh, you know, so we trademarked the name because you can't obviously use somebody else's trademark. And as I'm going up to announce the campaign, the Bring Back the Ottawa Senators campaign, which we did at like a 500 person luncheon that I think it was in the uh, Fairmont Shadow Laurier. Um, you know, a guy comes up to me and I don't know if you've ever been sued, uh, but a guy comes up to me Thank with you. something in his hand and he, he taps me on the shoulder. Are you Bruce Firestone? I look at him. Yes. And he says, you've been served. So I, I go, oh, just before I go up and give a speech, you know, yeah. <laughs> thanks for ruining my day. Yeah. And so I look at it and I see that we're getting sued uh, by uh, uh, the owner of the Ottawa Senators that played in, in a minor league at one point, mm -hmm. but they had never uh, trademarked the name or copyrighted it or anything. They had used it, it had been used, but it had never been uh, trademarked. We own the trademark. So I went to see the, uh, the, the, the brother and sister who controlled the Ottawa Senators in the 1950s. They played in a, a men's league. And I said, what is it with this lawsuit? And um, they said, well, we own the name. I said, well, we, we can't find any evidence of that. Have you got any evidence? And they said, well, we, we just do. Yeah. And I said, well, that's not actually evidence, you know? <laughs> and I said, listen, I'll tell you what, uh, when we get the team, I'll give each of you a pair of season tickets to see the, the, the new Ottawa Senators for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And the sister said, that's very generous. We accept. And the brother said, no way. I won't say what he said in between, yeah. but said, no <laughs> way. And the sister said, well, uh, I'm in. And so we, we did a deal with her, but, but he, 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 he was pretty stubborn. And he said, no. 
So when we got the team, she got her tickets for, for many, many, you know, a couple of decades, but he, his lawsuit never went anywhere, uh, unfortunately for him, but fortunately for us. And he did come back after a few years and say, you know that deal you offered me on season tickets? Uh, you know, if I sign over the rights of the name, this is after he lost the case. Yeah. He said, I'd like that deal. And I said, no. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I'm a usually generous guy, but this, it was a, no, that, the fact that they came up right before the, the first announcement with that uh, process server, I was, I was still mad. I'm, uh, here I'm 30 years later, I'm still bad. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I mean, in those early days there, obviously you said you, you were jet setting all, all across the country in the state, oh, yeah. that, you know, liaising with other owners and that. What, what were some of the things that you learned throughout that process that, uh, you know, you really put into practice th those first couple of years there? I'm really impressed with the questions here. You're a good host. You, first of all, you allowed me to hijack your, your show. And, and second of all, your questions are very good. I, I think one of the most, probably the most important thing I, I learned was the, uh, I learned from Bill Wirtz. Mm -hmm. Mr. Wirtz was the owner of the Chicago Blackhawks. He has now passed on, but um, I went to see him and um, uh, Mr. Wirtz owned an office building in, uh, in Chicago and, um, and three or four levels underground was his office. Mm -hmm. And I go into this uh, really tiny, tiny, tiny uh, sort of nightclub and it's got a couple of risers and a piano there, and it's got little tiny stools, and very uh, attractive young uh, women are serving uh, scotch and whatever. Else. This is 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, <laughs> and there's, uh, you know, it's smoky, you know, I guess people were allowed to smoke in, in bars at, at then. And so I had never met Bill before, and he shows up at 11. It's breakfast time. Mm -hmm. uh, not for, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm up at and five you know but but he would get up a little later and he'd come in very nice man and he would immediately light a cigarette and have a scotch and uh, a couple of eggs mm -hmm. uh so it was breakfast right and uh, uh so uh, and i'm looking around at the walls and there's uh, shots of barbara streisand and frank sinatra and all these incredible dean martin back in the day you probably don't know any of these names but they were really you know they were brad pitt in their day right yeah all of these wonderful performers had performed in this nightclub, you know, for, for an audience of maybe 30 people, you know. Uh, so it was a pretty special place in many ways, deep underground. And uh, Chicago can be quite a, a tough city, mm -hmm. if you understand where yeah. I'm going with that. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, so I'm meeting Bill for the first time. It's very dark in there. And, uh, and he has a couple of scotches. He talks like this. He says, yeah, Bruce, you want to know that? Key down, running on. NHL franchise. I said, yes, Mr. Wirtz, uh, I, I'd like to know. He said, all right, here's the key. Here, here it is. <laughs> he was a character and a half. He said, here's what I do every year. I tell my guys to hit the phones and sell 15,000 tickets and keep doing it until they do. He said, if you fill your building with fans, corporate sponsors want to be associated with it. You'll sell your signage, you'll sell your sponsorship, you know, you'll sell your media rights, you'll get all the money. You got to fill the, the, the building. Yeah. That's the key. And, and he's right. Even in the National Football League, where they can run their business uh, just on their media revenues, they don't really need any fans. So you could have these beautiful stadiums with 100,000 empty seats, as they're doing right now, and they can still, uh, you know, survive. The National Hockey League is not in that situation. I've heard estimates, uh, Kyle, that the NHL operating without fans this year potentially will lose a billion dollars yeah. you know, on 31 teams next year, 32, but this year, 31, you know, that's roughly 30 million plus per team. That's a minimum could be 40 million that each team will lose. I don't know. It's really difficult. So, so he was right. And I learned a lot from all of the owners that I, I met, but Bill was, was very special. And I'll tell you one more story about Mr. Wirtz. They were going to tear down the Chicago stadium. You know the old Chicago Stadium? I don't know. You're, you're too young to remember yeah, that. Before it became the United Center there. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, I mean, the new stadium is beautiful. It's yeah. huge, et cetera. But seeing a game in these very, very small arenas like the Boston Garden yeah. in, you know, the, the, the Chicago Stadium was really special. Mm -hmm. And they had this incredible pipe organ in the Chicago Stadium. And it was actually, you know, part of the building. So when they would play it, it's not like a little electronic organ. You play it, dun, 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 dun. 
you know that that's nice when you did it on this organ your every, your chest would boom 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 right you, you, it was just unbelievable so i said bill you i hear you're going to tear down your 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 building he said yeah yeah we're going to yeah, it's coming down i'm building yeah. it and uh, i said uh, what are you going to do with the pipe or ah, it's part of the building it's coming down i said really I said yeah yeah you know it, this thing was huge you know if you've ever seen you know the hunchback of notre dame i mean it's, it's bigger than that yeah. uh, and and so i said you know could i send a crew down and we're going to chip it out of out of the walls and we're going to we're going to put it in my new building in ottawa you know what you're gonna buy it. so he he got so mad at me he said I'm going to do that. And so he actually did. I saved their, their work. He actually did that. They chipped it out. They took it to the new building. But I, I was serious. I was going to go chip it up and put it in the uh, Canadian Tire Center. Yeah, yeah. Re Repurpose it there for sends you, say. Well, it would have been fantastic, you yeah. know, because, uh, you know, digitally, um, digital music is not the same as analog. I mean, analog music, uh, you know, if you, you've been to a few sense games, right? So, oh, yeah. you, you know, that we uh, we have an air horn in there, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and that is an air horn that we got from Via Rail. Mm -hmm. Because the very first game that we played, which was in 92, in October of 1992, against the Montreal Canadiens, Randy Burgess was doing the game day entertainment. We stole him away from a local radio station. Yeah, and we—he was supposed to play. You know, uh, we we had uh, like I, I I wanted the train horn sound because you know trains in Canada sort of go together. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want the truck horn. I wanted the train horn, and he had a digital version of a train horn. And we would score a goal. I think in the first we we didn't win many games, but we did win that first game five three over Montreal, and they were the eventual Stanley Cup champs. And after each goal, he was supposed to play the train horn. A after the game was over and it was, uh, it was a little quieter, I said, Randy, you, you didn't play the horn. What the hell? We scored five goals and I never heard it. He said, no, I did play it, but a digital recording just isn't the same. Yeah. I said, well, that's horrible. We're not, we got to do something better. So I said, call up Via Rail, see if they're uh, decommissioning any locomotives. And it turned out they were, and see if we can get one of their train horns, right? Because those things you can hear from five miles away. Yeah. And I remember Randy coming into my office and saying, I could get a train horn from Via Rail, but they said, are you guys completely out of your mind? You're going to let this off indoors? You better <laughs> test it first. So we were in a tiny building in the uh, Ottawa Civic Center downtown until we built the Palladium. And so we, we ran the, the first test, uh, they, they, they blow these horns at 120 PSI pounds per square inch. Yeah. And I said, well, let's try it at, at half that at 60. We tried it and literally you blow your eardrums out. So yeah. eventually we, we scaled it back to 20 PSI and at 20 PSI, whether it's the Canadian Tire Center or the old Civic Center, you could hear it plenty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. So, uh, I mean, talk about how times change as well here, right? We just recently had Vegas with their expansion draft and you wow, know, they yeah. know, rolled out the red carpet for them and they picked did. the litter for teams. Definitely wasn't the case for you guys there in terms of who was available, who no. you could pick, all, all oh of my that. Gosh. What was the process like in that, you know, expansion draft and your first actual entry draft with the team there? Yeah, you know, I was less concerned about that than most people. And uh, I was, uh, once I became an owner and part of the team, I was uh, on the Franchise Market and, and Analysis Committee, which is called FMAC, which is the senior committee of the National Hockey League Board of Governors. And uh, I think there's six or eight members of the board. And the following year, uh, Mike Eisner, who was CEO of the Disney Company, and um, uh, Wayne Huizinga, who was the owner of Blockbuster, if you know what that is, it was an <laughs> entertainment company back then. Yeah, they yeah. came and made a presentation to the NHL for expansion franchises in Anaheim, which became the Mighty Ducks of Anaheim, now just the Ducks. And back uh, on the other side of the continent uh, for the uh, Florida Panthers. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I said to, to my colleagues on the FMAC committee, I think we should change the expansion rules to be more generous for both Florida and Anaheim. I said, people in Ottawa, I think, are willing to put up with five years of, you know, of hockey that's trying to be competitive. Mm -hmm. But I'm not so sure about Florida, and I'm not so sure about Southern California. And uh, some of the members of the Board of Governors said, are you, I, again, I can't use the word, but are you friggin' crazy? Yeah. Um, why would we do that? And I said, well, 
I just think that we should try and be more like the National Football League. The National Football League has had revenue sharing, real revenue sharing for, you know, a couple of generations now. Mm -hmm. And uh, they think more collegially, you know, and so some of my colleagues said, you're a socialist, Bruce, from Canada, you know, <laughs> and I said, no, I don't think so. But, yeah. but I think if we take care of the entire entity, we'll all benefit, you know, you raise all the boats. Yeah. And eventually they did come around. And so Florida and Anaheim did have much better expansion rules. And of course, Las Vegas and, and the Seattle uh, team, don't tell me it's the and then not the kryptonites. What do they call it? Kraken. Kraken. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. See. Um, so so the, the you know they have much much I think better uh, rules. But I I think that does benefit the league to to rather than having you know somebody who who maybe gets twenty four points you 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 might have well Vegas was amazing. Did they make the Stanley Cup finals in yeah. year one? Yeah. I mean, it's incredible. Uh, unparalleled run. It was unbelievable. But I have to tell you, I was definitely cheering for them not to win. <laughs> and, and that's because i was jealous yeah yeah so I, I mean before we let you go I, i've got to get at least this question out there because not only are you you know former owner of an nhl yeah. franchise but also a real estate guy yourself too yeah yeah and, and you know much has been made about the LeBreton deal and you know, yeah. making the city butting heads and all that but yeah. you know it, it, in your opinion how important is it to the franchise and the city even to get a downtown arena and, and just sort of revitalize that whole core there? Well, you know, um, uh, back in the day, I did go and meet with the National Capital Commission who control Le Breton Flats. Mm -hmm. And uh, the chair of the National Capital Commission was Gene Piggott. And Mrs. Piggott was the chairperson and a very, very competent person in my opinion. And I said, Gene, you know, we're looking at a number of different sites. We're looking at uh, uh, Pierre Bourque's site, which is where the Casino de Lac Limi is in Quebec. Mm -hmm. We're looking at a site uh, where South Keys is now, a shopping center. Uh, south, uh, uh, we're looking at 174 Orleans, mm -hmm. obviously looking in Canada where the building actually is. And we were looking at the Breton Flats and Lansdowne Park. But I think my number one choice was, in fact, the Breton Flats downtown. And number two was Canada. Mm -hmm. But number one was definitely uh, Le Breton. And I, I asked Mrs. Pickett, would you consider letting us uh, have part of those lands? Uh, we'll buy them, uh, purchase them from the NCC and, and build a building there. Mm -hmm. And she says, do you want the private answer, Bruce, or the public answer? I said, are they different? She said, yes, they are. Well, what's the private answer? The answer is no. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is uh, Gene had a, and the NCC had a 150 year plan for Le Breton, which was to build major uh, institutions like what turned out to be the new war museum, mm -hmm. maybe a new Supreme Court of Canada building, uh, but it wasn't, and she said, Bruce, I'm sure you're going to build a, uh, you know, a nice rink, but to us it's just a rink and that's not our priority. So no. And I said, what's the public answer? She said, well, we don't like to say no to Canadians, you know? So what we say is we'll study it. We'll study it until one of two things happens, Bruce. Either you die or you go away, whichever comes <laughs> first. And we don't care. Yeah, Un unbelievable. So, so, so to answer your question, though, I do support moving the team to Le Breton. And I was overjoyed uh, when I heard a generation later that the NCC had had a change of heart. They wanted to animate the site with a major facility like the Palladium downtown. And uh, I supported that. And uh, Matt Rossetti, uh, Gino uh, Rossetti's son, who's the architect of the, the, the Palace of Auburn Hills and also the Canadian Tire Center, was involved. Barry Hoban is a local architect, serial leader, Mr. Melnick, the current owner. They, they, you know, John Ruddy, who's a tremendous, uh, uh, you know, citizen here in Ottawa, they were all involved in, in winning that. And I, I believe, uh, Kyle, I believe that owning the franchise and the rights to develop Le Breton makes the franchise much more valuable. So it's good for the city. It's good for the franchise. And then I was very disappointed when Mr. Ruddy and Eugene Melnick had a falling out and this whole thing fell apart. I think that is a mistake. And I'm not worried about Canada, you know, the West End of Ottawa, because that building uh, can be repurposed. I don't know if you know how they've repurposed uh, Maple Leaf Gardens. Mm -hmm. But it's it's a giant Loblaw superstore. It's got the uh, Madame Athletic Center, part of Ryerson University. They've done a wonderful job. So that building in Canada and the seven thousand could be a giant Walmart. I, I don't know, but it, <laughs> it'll it'll be fine. Don't worry about Canada. Worry about the team and the city. So and the other thing that has changed in the last twenty five years is that we have light rail now. Mm 
-hmm. Light rail can move 20,000 people an hour. Uh, the buses, even though the buses are terrific in Ottawa, can only move about four or 5,000 people an hour. So a downtown arena makes a lot of sense and I'm still hopeful, but I have talked to the people at the Sands now and they are planning, at least for now, for another generation in Canada. So who knows when it'll happen. Yeah, yeah. Well, who, who, like you say, who knows what the future will hold there, but uh, ho you'd, you'd like to see it get done for sure. I, I would. Yeah. So, Bruce, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. We'll, we'll be sure to throw up that link on uh, our Please website and, and all of that. So anyone who's listening, make sure you check that out. It's, it's going to be valid until January 4th. But for those who do want to maybe find out either more about yourself or what you do, wh where are some places that people can get in contact with you or learn uh, more about some projects you have going on? Yeah, so my main deal now is a, a real estate investment and business coach and, and um, lots of young people, you know, in their 20s, 30s and 40s, young to me anyway, uh, you know, are, are kind of fed up and even some older people are fed up with uh, some of the uh, alternatives for preparing for retirement. So from young people in their 20s, 30s and 40s to people in, even in their 50s and 60s, uh, they've been coming to me for the last seven or eight years for some real estate investment and business coaching. Because I, I do think that at least you could own your own home and maybe a couple of uh, you know rental properties. Uh, and there's some other business models that I specialize in. So uh, you know we, we have some pretty cool stuff that we're working on. So people come to me for a little bit of coaching and I enjoy doing it. You know, my dad before he passed away, uh, Kyle said, you know, people should never retire. What are you going to do? Sit around and watch TV all day? That'd be horrible. And so you might change what you do. And so after I retired from the University of Ottawa, where I was teaching, uh, I decided to do a little bit of coaching, not really knowing if anybody would want some, but, but they did. And so you can look me up, um, brucemfirestone.com. You have to put the M in there. That's my middle initial, Bruce M firestone.com and i'm all over the internet you can find my cell phone and my, my email address just put bruce firestone in google and it'll show some some good things and some not so good things <laughs> and the not so good things you know i have thirty thousand enemies i just wanted to mention this to everybody in ottawa uh, and they're called Maple Leaf fans. <laughs> they don't like me. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. I really Bruce. enjoyed it. I hope you have a happy holidays and, you know, best well, Merry Christmas to you and to everybody else. And it's my Christmas gift to, to all the folks there. I, I, I'd like them to read Don't Back Down. I think they'll enjoy it. Amazing.